From the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Yes, we are here. We've got people in from Adelaide, Australia, and Oak Harbor, Washington. We've got people in from Georgia, Scotland, Leslie, all the way in from Scotland, wherever you are tuning in from today. Welcome to the Badass Counseling Show. I am Sven Erlinson, the host of this fine train wreck, and I am joined in studio by KC, the inimitable KC over in the booth, and I've got Rob the Rocket running the whole schmear. Rob. Sadly, if this is a train wreck, I am the engineer. Yes, you are. You die first, Daddy-O. Um, <laughs> we're all going down, and you're leading the way. So let's get to work. Uh, we're taking listener questions. We've got everything, relationships, uh, career, motivation, children, uh, self, fitness, health, medical, grieving, whatever you got. All right. I'm starting one off here with someone with no name, and uh, they say, I have your book. Can you please talk about my son married an evil person, not part of our family? Okay, so your son married an evil person, uh, but what does the not part of our family mean? I hope your son married someone who wasn't part of your family, so that's a good start. Uh, but I, I don't understand that clause. So I'm just going to run with my son married an evil person. And I suppose you're wondering about what the hell to do. And the bottom line is, you know, that's a tough one. Do you want to lose your son? You know, to what degree do you have to play ball, you know, in order to keep access to your son? Would your son turn his back on you to be with his spouse? Now, very often people would because they're expected to show sort of loyalty to the one they love. Um, and so to some degree, you got to play ball or you got to, you know, walk away. Uh, but the bottom line is you don't have to eat anybody's shit also. So if this person that he married is an evil person, to use your words, I'll take your word for it, uh, you don't have to tolerate bad treatment from that person at all. And if your son decide, you know, tries to tell you, well, you have to blah, 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 you have a straight conversation with your son and you tell the truth, but you're not required to eat anybody's shit. You know, everybody would like everybody to get along, I'm sure, but your son's going to have to choose. If you push him to choose, he will choose. And if I were bet a betting man, which I am, I'd bet my left nut that he's going to pick his wife, unfortunately for you. Um, and so you're in a tough spot, but you don't have to let her hurt you. All right, next question. I just got out of an on and off relationship with a narcissist, believing every time he came back, he would keep his promises and change. Well, that didn't happen. Now I've been discarded. He kept saying he was done, but but didn't want me to leave. Uh -huh. Well, I left and threw his stuff out. It's over, and now he's going around telling lies about me. I don't understand why, since he wanted to be done. Why won't he just leave me alone? Well, if you want the truth, in his brain, he thinks that you hurt him. Okay, In his brain, you left him. The, the telling sentence for me is, um, I kept believing you would change and he didn't. And then you say, um, now I've been discarded. He kept saying he was done, but didn't want me to leave. That's, I'm telling you right there, that's the telling sentence, Vicky. He kept saying he was done, but he didn't want me to leave. In other words, I want you to stay and keep loving on me and giving me your attention and your sex and your loving and your hugs and your kisses and maybe your good cooking or maybe you mow a great lawn. I don't know, but he wanted you to stay and serve him, but he had no intention of investing anything in you. He says, hey, I'm done. I'm not giving you anything, but I expect you to stay. And by the way, if you don't stay, I'm going to be a fucking dick and tell people, you know, all manner of fuckery about you. And if you and I were in a session, I would want to ask you, well, what hurts more that you've been discarded, uh, that you kept opening your heart, he kept hurting you, or is it that he's telling people, uh, you know, going over and telling lies to people about you? I'm willing to bet it's probably the lies thing because for a lot of people, you know, they're willing to end the relationship, but when you start spreading lies about me, well, that hurts. And the bottom line is, is, it sounds like 
uh, you know, you don't have much control over that except to tell people the other side of the story. And you have every right to do that. You have every right to protect your name. And at some point, life has to go on. Life has to move on. And so you'd be wise to journal out some harsh letters towards them and go fuck yourself, you asshole, and all these things and flush out the anger and flush out the hurt. But in the end, he's going to tell people what he's going to tell people and your good name will stand on its own. And you have every right to stand up for yourself and say, that didn't happen. Here's what did happen. All right. Next question. Kind of a related uh, comment here, Mm -hmm. Sven. Same sort of topic from Justin. Justin says, Sven, you were right. On a previous lightning round, you said my relationship likely wouldn't work out. I realized how much of myself I lost hanging on and it was killing me. Mm. I had to end it. Wow. Yeah, that's always a tough one. That's always a tough one. Uh, letting go and you know having to see it for what it is, that this isn't going anywhere or they don't love me, something like that. All right. Um, Lucky says, a guy only texts, quote, I hope you are having a good day, end quote. Does he really care to know about my day? Well, he didn't ask a question, so I think it's safe to say he doesn't care to know about your day. Because if he wanted to know about your day, he would say, hey, how's your day going? When I saw Rob today at the studio, when I showed up at the studio, I said, hey, how's your day going? And he said, I had a good workout today. My day's going well. And he, and he said to me, how's your day going? I said, well, my day's going brighter now because I get to see you. And then Casey shows up and puts a dark cloud over everything. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Casey. I'm kidding. All right, next question. Uh, this is from Tracy. How do you deal with someone who accuses you constantly of cheating, but you haven't, and you can produce proof that you haven't? Always a tricky legal thing, proving I didn't do something. Um, But uh, you ask the question, how do you deal with it? You're being accused of cheating. Honestly, you just tell the truth, and you keep telling the truth. And you want to know how long you keep telling the truth? That's the interesting part. You keep telling the truth until you're sick of it. So you're sick of even having this fucking discussion. And then you say, listen, I'm going to give you one more chance to not ask me or if I'm cheating or not accuse me. I'm giving you one more chance. And you're not there yet, Tracy, but the day is going to come when you're going to be like, I'm going to give you one more chance to not keep accusing me. But if you do accuse me, I got to go. I'm just... I don't want to live this way. I mean, let's be honest, Tracy, when you haven't done something, but you're being accused of it, is that really your idea of a fun relationship? Well, obviously it's not. Otherwise you wouldn't have posted this question here. You fucking hate it. And just walk away. You're, you don't have to keep proving yourself and you don't have to live through that misery. And the fact that, yeah, there's no consequence for him or her asking you this constantly, that there's no consequence for it says they'll just keep doing it. It's their own fear driving the behavior. Um, and quite possibly it's them masking their own doing the same. Who the hell knows? But the bottom line is you don't have to tolerate that shit. Fuck that. All right. Uh, My song raised an interesting point. I've journaled and burned and journaled more, but I still don't feel like I'm letting go. Yeah, that's because there's something down deeper that you're not touching yet. And my question to you would be, what is it you're afraid of? In this whole situation of whatever it is that you're holding on to, you're afraid of something. You're afraid to let go. There's something you don't want to let go. And the reason you don't want to let go, as you guys have heard me say a million times, anytime you're trying to figure out why someone's doing something that doesn't make sense, always ask yourself the question, what's the primary fear driving the behavior? Speculate, write out a bunch of different answers and go with the biggest, hairiest, scariest one because it's always fear. So in this case, you're not letting go. You're afraid of something something you don't want to let go of or there's something you don't want to face or there's something you don't want to encounter i guarantee it all right next question i divorced a narcissist but we share custody of our children and is now affecting my kids my oldest has become aware of his dad's behavior and i can see he is struggling with conflicting feelings about his dad i'm trying to help my son work through this these issues but sometimes i don't know what to do i hear you I don't want to say anything bad about my ex, but I don't know how to help my kids. Okay, Uh, a few things. First of all, one of the best things you can ever give your children is a to be just a sounding board, just someone who will listen without trying to fix. So what I would encourage, if you see your son struggling, 
Uh, one of the things that I see doing this work for 30 years is when a child has been struggling and they'll say, no one reached out to me. I had a client last week. Um, uh, she was at her father's funeral, grandfather's funeral. She was close to her grandfather. And she said, I was there and no one, no one asked me how I was doing except one random uncle who came over and gave me a hug. But that was it. She said, no one, not my parents, no one asked about me, and I loved my grandpa. I was so close to my grandpa. So when you see a child struggling, when you see a child in pain, when you can see it, even if they haven't said it, you have the obligation, even if you're not the parent, you have the obligation because you know something's going on, because you have greater powers than the child does. Even if you're uncomfortable, they're a child. It's pretty hard to fuck up. If you go over and say, in this case, to your son, Sweetheart, it seems like you're struggling. When you're ready, talk to me. I'm here. You got to flush that out. You got to start getting it out of your out of yourself, son. And you give him a chance. And you know what? You guys, can I give you a little tip? I have questions that I repeatedly come back to. Maybe it's when I'm in a session. Maybe it's when I'm talking to somebody on a plane. Maybe when it's um, talking to a, um, Stephanie, my friend at the at the liquor store where I get my gin. And I have a bunch of questions that I ask. When I sense somebody, somebody's got something going on, these are just standard questions. You can make up your own. Questions like, what's the hardest part about that? When somebody's telling you something and you can tell it's hard for them or they're struggling or they're going through a rough time, what's the hardest part? And you can always preface it by saying, you know what, it's none of my business and you don't have to, boy, you say that and all of a sudden all the pressure is off of that person. They don't feel like they're on the spot or this is weird. Just say, hey, it's none of my business, but I'm just curious. What's the hardest part? Second question, what's the most painful part? Okay. Third question, what has been uh, the one thing you've least wanted to talk about with this, with anyone? And really one of the killer questions is simply, what are you most afraid of in all of this? Now, some people will say, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, of course it's bullshit, but they're you know covering their ego, whatever. But these are questions you can be asking your son. She was asking about her son, you know, son as a narcissist father and, you know, and so on, giving him a sounding board. But also what I'd recommend is if he's really struggling, get the kid in therapy, get him a teen therapist. These, these people that do this work are generally so fucking good at what they do. And it's a, it is a specialty. Let me tell you, working with kids under 18 is a specialty. Working with kids under 10 is a, is a, is a separate specialty. Those under six is a separate specialty, but teenagers, some people have a gift for it, but he needs to be talking it out. I mean, I would encourage you to encourage your son to start journaling. We just taped an episode of the show, uh, another episode this evening, and this gentleman was 46 years old. And he said, you know, he's been journaling for years, and he would do it at critical times in his life. And uh, so it's not just a woman thing. It's not, you know, some people think, oh, diaries are for girls. No, my mom started me journaling when I was 13. One of the best freaking things she's ever done for me. You know, teach your son how to also self-heal in addition to you listening to him and asking questions and not pressuring him, but keep checking back in with your son, encouraging him to open up and then uh, be ready for it because he may open up at the most of what you may think is the most inopportune time when you're, you know, cooking dinner for a family of four or, or you're, you know, on the road or you're just pulling into whatever, you know. So that's that. Next question. You got one over there for me, Rob. Yes, sir. AP asks, does the pain ever ease? A year ago, I lost my father. This is the day of my birthday, too, and Father's Day is very difficult. I've had only myself since then. It hurts still. Oh, does the pain ever ease? Oh, absolutely, but it doesn't ease magically. It's not just going to magically go away. People say time, you know, time uh, heals all wounds. It doesn't. It doesn't. It just stuffs it down. But if you actually want to heal... If you actually want the pain to go away, you have to actively, you have to take active steps to getting it out. That's what therapy is, okay? And I'm not doing a commercial for therapy. You guys know me well enough to know that the, I believe the one therapy that'll do the most is pen and paper. Sit down and write your dad a letter. I'm serious. All your feelings. Maybe you're mad at him for dying on you. I don't know. Maybe you're really, really sad. Maybe you feel like, you know, some dream died with him. You know, some dream you had of how you wanted to spend your later years with your dad or, 
you know, you couldn't wait to see him as a grandfather to your kids or whatever it is. Start flushing out all your feelings. But no, if you're just keeping that inside, it's not going anywhere. And on those holidays, such as your birthday, such as Father's Day, such as, you know, you had your first Christmas without him last Christmas, things like that, when more feelings are coming up, you got to give those an avenue. You've got to give them a conduit for getting out of you. Otherwise, it's still in you. You guys, until the pain is out of you, it's still in you. So we take these steps to actively flush them out. That's what you need to be doing, brother, because you're not just going to magically let go. The feelings aren't just going to magically go away. You have to be active. You have to be deliberate. This is deliberate soul work, deliberate spirituality, deliberate work. And guess what? This shit works, man. I'm serious. I see it all the time. I've seen people heal from war trauma. I've, I've helped people heal from the death of children more times than I care to count. And they do heal. And the pain does go away. It's enormous. But the more you have the courage to go in and keep going in, the healing is happening. I believe in the body's own and the mind's and the soul's own natural abilities to heal when facilitated by avenues for doing so. All right, next question. Oh, this is interesting. Kathy, Kathy said, I heard grief is love not having a place to go. Grief is when you have love inside of you for someone and that love has no place to go. And so it just comes out through your tears and your sadness and so forth. That's beautiful. I love that. I've got so many questions. I'm just trying to pick. uh, Go ahead, Rob, if you have one. Well, I've got an attaboy here if you want to hear an attaboy. Sure. They're always fun. Uh, Clara says, Sven, you've helped me realize why I couldn't be happy being a CNA. I was only doing that profession to make my family proud. And I got those voices out of my head. I've always wanted to work in a bakery or have my own bakery. Now I do work in a bakery with excellent pay and I'm truly getting to do what I love. Thank you, Sven. I love that. Somebody going from a CNA, right? to I want to be, I want to work in a bakery. How great is that? That somebody aspired to be a baker. I mean, what a cool story. I just love that. You know, I, I, I was approached, Rob, you remember this. I don't know, five years ago, was it? Four years ago, I was approached. In the last 10 years, I've been approached nine times to uh, have a show made about me or to host uh, some TV show on some other premise. Right. And one of the times... It was a show that they had called Flipping Callers. I'll post, sometime I'll post the pilot that they made. It's a little four minute pilot and, uh, or sort of a pitch, uh, you know, a f- film. And it was people making transition from white collar to blue collar, not vice versa. And uh, this sort of smacks of that a little bit. And uh, just that there's so many cool things out there. Wanted to be a baker. I love that story. That's awesome. All right. Uh, We just had this question earlier, but here it is again, so I'm going to knock it out real quick. Nicole says, what do you do when you've written the letters that you don't send, but the pain still exists? You keep journaling, you keep sending letters, but here's the thing. There's something down there deeper. There is something down there deeper. There is even more pain or there's something, some pain in particular that you don't want to touch. It's too scary. And yes, as Beverly follows up, you got to keep writing, but you got to keep going deeper. All right. What is psychological brainwashing? Can you help? As you all know, I am not a psychologist. I am a soul counselor, former clergyman, and uh, former trauma counselor. I've had a counseling practice for 30 years, the last 10 of which have been in and around Manhattan. So the idea of psychological brainwashing, uh, out of my lane. But I will say this. The idea of brainwashing someone really isn't anything new that somebody experiences in adulthood that to some greater or lesser degree, each of us is brainwashed as a child. And part of my work is going down into those original messages that you were taught to believe about yourself that may not have even been intentional. So this brainwashing of self is teaching you that you are something that you're not or that you're not something that you are. In other words, it's causing someone else to distrust their own inner voice. You know, the shorthand nowadays is, oh, it's gaslighting. Well, sure, but it's such an overused phrase, it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it does, but it's just like one of those phrases, it's like, oh my God, is another person going to say gaslighting? Is another person going to say narcissist? Um, not that there's anything wrong with it. It gives you language. Hey, God bless you. But it's causing someone to doubt themselves. And my work is all about really fundamentally one thing, to bring you into communion with 
intimate relationship with your own self. And people say, well, what the hell does that even mean? It means you've got so many other fucking voices inside of you that are causing you to think this about yourself or go this way with your career or raise your children that way or whatever it might be. You've got all these other voices and you're not being authentic to yourself. You may think you are, but you're not. As long as you are answering to external power sources that have become internalized, uh, as long as you're doing that, you're not living authentically. So the more you get those voices and those messages and those pains out of you, the more you're living authentically. You're acting from a sense of self. So therefore, any sort of brainwashing or gaslighting is causing you, causing someone else to not be who they really are and not listen to their own voice. Much more to come right after this short break. Okay. Well, you've, you've heard the podcast. You've listened to other people's issues. Maybe you've studied hundreds of Sven's TikTok videos. Time to stop lurking, face your fears, and focus directly on the one person in your life who can benefit the most from Sven's experience and insight. Now, that would be you. Just go to badasscounseling.com and order Sven's book, There's a Hole in My Love Cup. Or check out his many video courses. Sven found a way to help himself out of a 12 years depression. It worked for him, and it can work for you too. Check out badasscounseling.com today. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. All right, we are back with more of a lightning round of the Badass Counseling Show. Uh, Meg asks, how do you detach from someone, whether it be a lover, a friend, family member, a boss that you really like to work with? You flush out the feelings journaling, writing letters you don't send, you detach. What's keeping you attached is that you have feelings inside for that person or feelings of animus, anger, whatever, towards that person. It's your feelings inside that are keeping you attached. Therefore, if those feelings are no longer inside of me, I will no longer feel attached. It's not that you're actually attached, like there's a clip on you know around your hip and there's a clip on their hip and it's just clipped. So just click that click. Click the clip and you can go about your business. No, you're not actually attached. You feel attached. Therefore, what if I got that feeling of attachment and or whatever messages are driving it out of me, then I would no longer feel attached. All right. I'm not really sure this is directly in your lane, but it's interesting. Go ahead. What should I do when my boss says I need to accept that my coworkers will disrespect me because I'm a woman in a man's field? <laughs> is the person saying, what should I do? Yep. You should go to HR because the person, the, your boss is fundamentally telling you, you just got to accept it. You just got to eat it. When you're, when what's happening to you, Rob, how does she put it? This is Doris who says, what should I do? And my boss says, I need to accept my coworkers accept. will disrespect me because you I'm a woman. You need to accept fundamentally being abused in the workplace, being uh, bullied in the workplace. You need to accept it. Your boss is basically saying, I am a wuss and... I have no courage and I'm not going to offend you. So you have to let someone treat you badly. Now, maybe you don't want to go to HR, but you would be definitely be justified in going to HR and saying, what's this bullshit? I have to accept bad treatment, bullying in the workplace. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. And then saying you got to accept it because you're a woman. Well, that's great. The, he's, your boss is just building the lawsuit for you it's like okay so now we've got you know gender discrimination and saying you need to accept being bullied i mean what are you asking me i'm betting you've already considered that option yeah yeah she says i'm not allowed to go to hr unless i have my bosses to back me up as i go up the chain of command no you can hr exists to protect you and and you no 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 no, no. this is like whistleblower shit this is bullying shit I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure you fear it being used against you. I mean, you report your boss. Yeah, you think he's going to be or she is going to be all kumbaya with you? No. And maybe you don't want to do that, but you don't have to have your boss. That's their way of covering their ass. HR exists to protect you. And if they're not going to do it, you know what? If I'm being totally honest with you, I'd stick your cell phone in your in your breast pocket 
on your favorite shirt and go in and talk to your boss again saying they're doing it and get it on tape, him saying or her saying, you just got to accept it that you're going to be bullied basically because you're a woman. Get that on tape. Then go to HR. What, Rob? You're wagging your head. No, I'm agreeing with you. And it's just crazy to say I can't go complain about my boss unless my boss is there to back me up. Exactly. What? Exactly. No, 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 no. That's not a healthy environment. I would do everything you could to get, because uh, your boss obviously is going to deny it. So if you can get proof of that before you go to HR and get multiple proof of in different forms or it happening different times, I would build the case because that's bullshit. Nobody should have to go. Who wants to go to a job that they work 40 or 50 hours a week and have to put up with that bullshit? That's so wrong. All right, next question. I'm going through a divorce after 25 years of marriage. What are your top three therapy ideas you highly recommend? I've been working on myself and independent stability. Going through a divorce after 25 years of marriage, I would recommend, you don't mention that there's cheating involved, so it doesn't necessarily require someone who has uh, some measure of expertise in infidelity, but I would get somebody who specializes in grief, to be honest with you. And I would actually also consider someone who specializes in grief and or anger, because I'm sure you have anger, especially uh, it, whether you're being left or you're leaving because this person just drove you you know, so far. But those things in particular, but the, in the end, it boils down to you want somebody who's going to push you. You want somebody who's going to push you to go deeper and deeper and deeper and get at those raw, real fucking feelings. And if it's not grinding you and you're not feeling anger and or extreme sadness, you're not down to the real shit. But just keep flushing out all that shit, whether in therapy or on your own. And you're well on your way to your own healing. All right. Um, this person says, I'm halfway through your book. And I really enjoyed the bit on quitting. Uh, yes, I am a big, I am big on quitting. If your heart's not in it, get the fuck out. It, just get out. I, I am not a fan of finishing things for finishing sake. I believe that life is too short. But not only that, I just believe that find the things that you have no desire to quit and then go with 100 miles an hour with your hair on fire. Kim says, we're getting a lot of book questions today. Kim says, no energy for homework, quote unquote homework after completing each chapter. Tips on breaking it down? It's interesting you say you have no energy for homework um, after completing each chapter. I'm just, By homework, you mean the journaling questions and so forth at the end of the chapters that you don't have energy for that. What I would I want to ask you is, is it that you don't have energy or you just really don't want to attack those questions? Because those are deep questions. Those are powerful questions. The questions and the journaling recommendations in each chapter are your interface of your life with the insights of that chapter. Take away the journaling questions and that interface, and it's just, it's just the insights of the book. It, there's no there's no place where your life and the the thoughts and the theories of the book overlap. So I'd want to ask you, is it when you say you don't have energy, does that mean you just don't want to do that work because it scares the fucking shit out of you? Or what do you mean when you say, so you're saying, are there tips on bringing it down? Sure, do start with one question and journal on one question. Then go to the second one before you ever even go on to the next chapter. Some books are meant to be read slow, slowly and done slowly. Or what some people do, I have tons of people who read the book through first, and then they go back and read it a second time and do the exercises. You can do that. But understand, there's no rush. There's no, there's no victory that comes from finishing quickly. The goal of the work, of the books, is to go into them and let them take you deep and to go deep. It's not to rush through. You can't rush the the healing process or the growth process or the change process, you just got to go into it and let it sort of lead you and listen to your gut. What is my gut saying I should read today? Or what is my gut saying that uh, I should be writing about today? Which questions? And if you need to go a little slower, go slower. Fuck it. All right, next question. Ashley asked this question. I love this question. How do I know what I need in a relationship? One of the things I tell people, not just with relationships, but with career, with self, whatever, is I say, the path to discovering who you are requires discovering who you're not. And what that means is, even if you don't know what you want, I'm betting you'll know the things you don't want. And that is to say, when something doesn't feel good, just start with that. Something that doesn't feel good, don't allow it. Something doesn't feel good, don't do it. 
The way someone's treating you doesn't feel good, call them out on it. Say, I, I, I can't let you do that, okay? That's you catching the red flags. All right, but if you don't know what you need in a relationship, that tells me either you've never had relationships in your past or you've had them, but you've not sort of dissected them or to use that phrase we all love, processed them. And part of what journaling is, is we ask ourselves those questions. Well, what sucked about that relationship that I just came out of? What was the best part? You know, when did I feel the most anxiety? And you're journaling all these questions out and you're writing out your answers. What was the saddest part? And the more we take the meat off the bone, the more we analyze the past, whether it's the immediate past or the distant past, the more we discover about ourselves. If you're not a student of history, you're fucked. And by history, in this case, I mean your own history. If you don't study your own history, yes, you're going to repeat mistakes, but worse, you're just going to live an unfulfilled life because you're just sort of rudderless. But doing those two things, analyzing your past relationships, what felt good, what didn't feel good, what hurt, what would I not want to experience again? And that's the second piece. And that just don't allow things that don't feel good. That's a huge step towards having a life that does feel good because the more you set up those boundaries and have the no's, the more the yeses, the things you naturally want will effortlessly flow up from within. Rochelle asked this question. How do my teenagers protect themselves when they have to spend time with their narcissistic dad? You have to teach them to be strong. You have to teach them to stand up. First of all, if you have the opportunity, if he is in fact hurting them or hurting them emotionally, you have to protect them. That is your job. It's not done just because they're teenagers. You have to protect them and you have to keep going to them and encouraging them to flush it out with you, teaching, getting them therapists if that's what they need. And I, I would actually re recommend it in this case and giving them a, an opportunity to talk about their stuff without you allowing your own stuff to mix in there and without you trying to fix them. But you have to teach them to stand up for themselves. You do. Now, if there's abuse, well, then you have an opportunity to, or an, and an expectation that you have to report that and you have to get after it and not allow that. But you have to teach them to stand up. You want to know why? Because by you teaching them to stand up against someone who is an extreme taker, what you call a narcissist, by you teaching them to stand up, you are rendering unto them a counter message. You are teaching them that the message you're getting from your father, that he's dominant and he runs the show and it's all about him, is not true, is not accurate, and that's not a good way to go through life. But if you are silent, you are saying that this is how you should respond then in life. You should live in silence. You should walk on eggshells. You should allow someone else to make your relationships about them. So guess what they're going to choose in their boyfriend, girlfriend relationships? Guess what they're going to choose in their lovers? Shit that exactly mirrors dad, all right? And or where they're just living the opposite, all right? And so you have to provide that counter message and you have to help them begin to find their no and find their voice. Otherwise, what's the message they are getting? They don't matter and that you need to just keep your mouth shut and keep your head down. Those are the messages you're sending to your kids. All right. Hey, Sven, every show, every podcast, we say this is not medical advice. So maybe you can generalize this question about being supportive to your kids. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Curious on your opinion on parents waiting till after age 18 to support teens transitioning medically to a different sex from birth. And, and what are they asking me for? Curious about your opinion on waiting until the child is 18. Before you help them? Before you allow it, let's say. Yeah, because that would be a parental decision. You know, that's a tricky one. I actually, just this morning, uh, we had someone on the show, um, Elvis. Do you remember Elvis? A gay um, trans man, yes. Yes, uh, trans man. And uh, I was talking with Elvis recently, and uh, I always enjoy our conversations, and I've had many trans clients over the years, and parents of trans clients. This isn't a new phenomenon. It's actually been around a lot bigger than or a lot longer than the furor that goes on in our general society right now but thoughts on parents well honestly what i would tell you is this what i would tell you parent parents is you need to be in therapy to be very honest with you not because there's something wrong with you i don't mean it like that you need to have a therapist that you can go to to begin to flush out all your feelings and talk about it the confusion the anger the sadness the disappointment the excitement the exuberance, the resistance, 
all of your shit. You want to know why? Because you're likely otherwise going to be making any decision you make from a place of being highly emotionally charged. We don't make good decisions from a place of being highly emotionally charged. We make great decisions from a place of flushing out all the feelings and coming from a place of calm. And what I would do, and see the calmer you are because you've gotten your feelings out, guess what you're able to do? You're able to listen to and talk with this child that you love so much, this fruit of your womb, this seed of your own dinky. You're able to listen to and talk with and be present to them rather than it just being about you. Now, up until they're 18, yeah, it is a communal decision because you are responsible for this child, all right? After 18, you really don't get a say, okay? But boy, what an opportunity to bond with your child. What an opportunity to make them feel accepted and loved. And even if we don't make the decision right now, I want to hear what's going on on inside of you, son or daughter. I want to hear and talk to me. Help me understand. Boy, you come in with an honest spirit of wanting to understand and people open up if they feel it's safe. But at the very least, just if, if you are opposed to the idea of your child you know, transitioning, it doesn't change the fact that you are still responsible for protecting the emotional well-being of that child the emotional well-being. That means you have a responsibility as the parent, yeah, even if they're teenagers, to create a safe place, safe space for their feelings to come out. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're driving their feelings down deeper. And, and now I'm talking to all parents, not just parents of a, of a trans child. I'm talking to all parents. You have a responsibility to create a safe space where your child can let their feelings out. We just had someone on the show tonight, Rob. We did a counseling episode. And he was six years old, and he was sexually molested by two old, uh, two same age and slightly older female cousins. And he kept his secret in his whole life. He never told his mom because he didn't feel like it would be safe because she'd make it all about her feelings. And, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm so upset. Blah, blah. She would have made it about her. So tragic. So tragic. And that was... That was sexual molestation. We're talking about transitioning gender. It can be anything. But when you don't even feel safe talking to your own parents, the ones whose job it is to protect your emotional life, to protect your spirit, to protect your soul, to protect your belief in your own self and your own goodness. That's your job, parents. That's your job. That's your job. And it doesn't stop at 18. Right. Right. So get your own feelings out. Work on your own emotions. Get a therapist. Get your own shit out so that you can be present to your child. And what an amazing gift. Whatever the decision ends up being isn't the point. What an amazing gift to have the opportunity to have your child trust you with their most intimate stuff and they feel safe because they know you're not going to judge or condemn or fix or twist or make them do what you want them to do, but you're going to be present to them regardless of what the decision ends up being. But we can still be together because shoot, if you can't teach your children how to work through resolution or work through conflict and work through hard discussions, what are you preparing them for in adulthood? Where are they going to learn that? Because you and I both know they're going to have a million of those conflict discussions in life. They're going to have a million different times in work, in relationships, in friendships. They're going to have a million times where they've got to be able to sort through a complex situation. Start teaching them now by your example. Now that's good parenting. I'm going to take one more question, and then we are going to call it a night because it's sleepy time at our house. All right. All right, I'm going to take this last one. This is from Stephanie. How do I mend the relationship with my father that I've felt so neglected by? Stephanie, I would want to ask you the question, why do you want to mend your relationship with your father? Nothing wrong with it. I'm just curious why you want to. It's interesting that you say uh, that you felt so neglected by him, and yet you don't say, how do I get my father to fucking apologize and acknowledge what he's done? You don't say that. You say, I want a relationship. You don't lead with, I want him to acknowledge the pain he's caused me, right? And this is very, very, very common. In fact, I had a client just today we had this exact same discussion, except I think it was an elderly mother and my client was in their 60s. 
you say I've felt neglected, but you're not wanting sort of recompense. You're not wanting sort of, uh, you're wanting the relationship back, to which I would ask, then what? Let's say you get that relationship. Then what? What do you mean, then what? I mean, what do you want then? If you get the relationship, then what? And I'm going to step you guys through what the general answers usually are. Well, if I got that relationship, then I'd finally have the father I never had. Ah, okay, that's fair. So you want to have the father you never had. And if you got the father you never had, then what? Well, shit, I don't know. We'll take a guess at it. Well, if I had the father I never had, I guess I'd finally get that love that I always wanted. Okay, you got the love you always wanted. And then what? What do you mean? I mean, then what? I guess I'd feel good. I guess I'd feel like complete or whole, like that big hole inside of me is finally filled. I guess I'd feel maybe some peace. I'd feel some relief, like I'm okay and there's not something wrong with me. Exactly. Now we're getting down to the shit. You don't want the relationship with your dad. I mean, sure you do. You want that, but what you really want is the fruit of that. And the fruit of that is getting the very thing that he never gave you. And that is confirmation of your worth. That is safety, that you have a home, that you have your tribe, you have your people. What you get from it is that sense of, because you've been running your whole life. You've been running and running either away from or with this giant the thing inside that says you're not good enough, you're unlovable, you're unwantable, your own father has neglected you. I just posted a video on neglect uh, three days ago. Go check it out. It's pretty fucking intense. Uh, it's about abuse, but specifically neglect, which is sort of the bastard stepchild of all the abuses. So often people think neglect is an abuse. Some say it's far, far worse than abuse, or not than abuse. It's of the abuses. It's one of the worst. And so it's interesting, yeah, what you're wanting, I'm willing to bet, is you're still wanting something from your father. What you're really wanting is confirmation of your worth, that you matter, which means you're basically in a jail jail cell of believing you don't matter, and you believe that he and only he has the key to your cell, when in fact the keys have been in your pocket the whole time. And you may discover, depending on how old you are, Stephanie, that you probably have a couple of decades, maybe three, four decades already of a pattern in your father's behavior that indicate he has no intention of validating your worth. And so you say, how do I mend the relationship with my father? Um, well, <laughs> you can go and be who he wants you to be, but how validating, validating is that going to be? It's going to invalidate your authentic self. You're just being who you, he wants you to be so that you can get his love. What I would recommend you do instead is begin to look at why what it is, why you're so terrified of looking at the fact that your father has no intention of giving you the love you've always wanted and deal with that grief and the death of feeling validated by your father. And the more you get all that rage out of you and what a crumb bum he's been for not meeting your needs and get all that sadness out of you, you are in fact validating yourself because you are validating your feelings. The very thing you've been asking him to do, validating your worth, validating your feelings. Um, but yeah, you're, you're wanting it cause you're still wanting something from him. And remember what I tell you guys, if you want something from someone, they now have the power to make you miserable by not giving it to you. You are giving your power to another person when they have something that you want. And once you no longer want it, they no longer have the power to make you miserable. So Stephanie, you are still wanting something from your father. And that is why you're miserable and wanting that relationship because you think if I could just get that relationship, then I could get that validation, that peace, and that relief. And that may not be how it works out. You're better off healing yourself. The book is There's a Hole in My Love Cup. You can get it at badasscounseling.com as well as my other book, Badass Wisdom. They are both at badasscounseling.com, available as audiobook, ebook, and paperback, and even hardcover in the case of Badass Wisdom. Thank you, you guys. This has been a delightful uh, episode of Q&A with my fine followers and new friends and everyone that's just found us for the first time. It's great to have you here. Rob, Yo. what say you? Lots of good information today, and we packed a lot in. 21 questions and comments in the show, which is uh, more than usual, and it was all in-depth perfectly, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And as Ayla said on YouTube... 
Thank you, Sven, Rob, and Casey. Keep being amazing and helping us all with each episode. Well, thank you for saying so, Ayla. And yes, yes, yes. Thank you to everyone for your questions. And yes, uh, several of you are saying, ah, this is so painful. This is so hard to do. It is, you guys. It is. But, you know, what's the old saying that... You know, good things in life take time, to quote the Rock Group Chicago in uh, I've Been Searching So Long. Um, but, you know, anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. And it really requires a sacrifice of being willing to go into the pain. The cave you most fear to enter holds the treasure you seek, to quote Joseph Campbell. Well, people, it's been great having you here. Another wonderful episode of the Badass Counseling Show, Lightning Round. On behalf of my dear friends, KC and Rob the Rocket, Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Sven Erlins, and this is the Badass Counseling Show podcast. Have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day.